Good morning. Um, I want to share with you part of my recent journey to the congregation and the importance of Unitarian Universalism to the issue of freedom. But in addressing this topic, I think it's important to start with a note of gratitude. Today, seven billion people are walking the face of this earth, and the Population Reference Bureau tells us that 100 billion people preceded us here. Compared to the vast majority of humans, we enjoy liberties that most ever, others have never experienced. A thousand years ago in medieval Asia or Europe, you wouldn't be asking questions like, where do I want to live? What do I want to do with my life? Most humans lived in an era where those questions were answered for them. High school history classes often emphasize brief moments in antiquity where it seemed there was liberty. But those moments of apparent freedom don't withstand close scrutiny. <clears throat> Greece was a slaving society. Rome was a slaving society. The Florentine Republic opened participation up to just a few men who were wealthy landowners. And since the advent of monotheistic religions, there have been notable moments of religious tolerance in places like Spain, Sicily, or the Near East. But toleration did not mean equality in any of those places, and it didn't last in any of those places. You might find yourself worshiping in a synagogue in 1391 only to hear a voice outside telling you you had two choices, convert to Christianity or death by fire. Through much of history, when a leader changed religions, his people did as well. And most of humanity is subjected to discrimination or tyranny beyond what we experience, not to mention the oppression of poverty. So when it comes to liberty, I think we are the 1%. Most, and the thing is, most of us in this room, probably none of us in this room, did anything to deserve that. We just had the plain luck that we were born in a place and time where this takes place. And I think we all have to be grateful for our extraordinary luck. But if we're the privileged few, what does this topic of freedom even mean? Is, is the concept of freedom, freedom meaningless to most humans? I, I don't think it is. I believe that freedom is a fundamental element of the life of every human being, regardless of circumstance. First, freedom means a lot more than options and alternatives. And if I can give an example to make the point, you know, for, uh, this week I went into the store to buy some toothpaste. And I looked on the shelves and it occurred to me, there are 50 different choices I have. You know, I thought I could get paste, gel, baking soda, enamel protection, total protection, brightening, whitening, extra white, maximum bright. So I had a whole lot of options and alternatives. But none of that had anything to do with freedom. And I think in the Western world, and particularly in the United States, we often confuse the issue of liberty of choice and the issue of a greater spiritual freedom. And it's that greater freedom is the one that can't be taken away from people. Let me ask you to consider the world words of a couple people who had no liberty of choice. Kayla Mueller was in the news recently when it was disclosed she died after being held in capti captivity by ISIS. And from all that I read, this was a remarkable woman who was mature beyond her years and simply wanted to help those who suffered. She wrote a letter that was delivered to her family and read after her death. And in her condition, she wrote, I have a lot of fight left in me. I will not give in. Even in prison, one can be free. So what was she talking about? How can you be free in captivity? She didn't survive to tell us, but we can look a little further back in the 20th century to someone who did survive. Viktor Frankl was an Austrian psychiatrist who survived four concentration camps in World War II. And he wrote about our ability to choose the meaning we will attribute to the circumstances of our lives, even if those circumstances involve all but the complete loss of liberty. He said, we who lived in the concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts, comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but they offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Now, perhaps ironically, part of my path to this congregation came a couple years ago when I started reading Dante's Divine Comedy. Um, 
it's a work I probably never would have touched when I was younger, and I think one that's terribly mischaracter mischaracterized in popular culture. First and foremost, it's a poem of exile. Dante got involved in a political dispute in Florence. He was kicked out and told if he, could, if he ever returned, he would be put to death. And this poem, I think, is a product of his pain of exile. I think the basic premise of the Divine Comedy is that freedom is the most fundamental aspect of what it means to be human. His journey through the afterlife has been called his journey to freedom. And as we're, we were reminded by the story today, the concept of hell is probably not popular in the universalist tradition, not to mention the atheist tradition. But I, don't, I think for Dante, hell wasn't about punishment. For Dante, hell was a choice. And his point was that not even God has the power to negate the identity that a human soul chooses for itself. And that makes freedom of each soul a kind of absolute. So I want to just highlight a short segment of that poem that struck a chord with me. Dante starts his journey through the Inferno with his guide Virgil. <clears throat> and on their way, Dante sees a huge number of souls who are crying out, some of whom he thinks he recognizes. Uh, and he asks Virgil about it. Virgil explains that those are the neutrals. They were the people who were given the gift of freedom and did nothing with it. Now, all through this poem, Dante goes through hell and purgatory and paradise, interviewing people, hearing the stories that the souls have to tell. And so here, Dante says, hey, wait a second. I want to know their names. I want to hear their stories. And this is the one time when Virgil says no. He says, they have no names. They have no stories to tell. And they, these are the people who rejected the gift of freedom. Dante is astounded by the number of neutrals. And I think that tells us something. Virgil tells Dante that the neutrals envy those in every other part of the afterlife, whether they're in paradise or inferno. At least they made a choice. At least those other souls did something with their freedom. At least they lived. I found different parts of the Divine Comedy make impressions upon different readers based upon their own experience. And for me, this issue of neutrality has been a problem in my life. And so I think it stood out to me. What's wrong with neutrality? It worked really well for Switzerland for many years. Um, and sometimes, you know, when you're neutral, it seems like you're above the fray. But I think the answer is that neutrality is the ultimate act of putting the self first. When you're neutral, you don't take a risk. If you don't take up a cause or purpose, you never end up on the losing side. And when you think about injustice, all the injustice that we've experienced, if you take a side, most of the time you're going to be on the losing side. And often there are consequences for being on the losing side. For Dante, there were consequences. He was kicked out of the place he loved. And personally, for me, I often find it difficult in conservative Orange County, where there are not simply majority views, but really dominant views, to break out of that mold of neutrality. But freedom, I believe, is the responsibility that I have for deciding who I am and not just deciding it in my head, in my thoughts or my ideas, but in living it. No one can deprive me of that spiritual freedom, but I'm the one who has the responsibility to make the choice. And for me, that's where Unitarian Universalism came in. When I first came to the service a couple years ago, I didn't respond to the invitation at the beginning to identify myself. I didn't know what I was getting into. <laughs> but. Uh, but after the service, Jay Keithan came over to me. He recognized me as a newcomer. He said, we're glad you're here. And then he said, this is a tough religion. No one is here to give you any answers. You've got to figure it out for yourself. So I said, thanks, Jay. <laughs> uh, but it seems to me that's what we're all invited to do. And in supporting a search for answers, we explicitly recognize that we don't have them. And if we don't have them today, we're probably not going to have them tomorrow either. So we'll, we may never figure out all the pieces of this puzzle. But we also don't get to defer life while we're in contemplation. We have to exercise our freedom and choose our identity and do it on the fly even when we don't have all the answers. So we, we hear a lot within these walls about celebrating the tolerance of Unitarian Universalism. But for a moment, I want to share with you one thing I appreciate is an element of intolerance. In my experience, Unitarian Universalism in general, and this congregation as well, 
is no friend of neutrality. Lots of positions and viewpoints can be accepted, but there's no sympathy for standing on the sidelines and watching other people play the game. The list of congregation activities makes a statement about the expectations that you'll get involved. The covenant we recite each week is less about our beliefs than our willingness to take action. And when we recite the covenant, we say service is its law. The whole thing is based upon taking a stand. When I started coming here and reading up about Unitarian history, I learned that it's a small sect of about 220,000 people in the United States. So that means if our membership grew by 50%, we would be 0.1% of the US population. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, I contrasted that reading a list of notable Unitarians. And it's not just names we hear often, like Emerson, Thoreau, Whitman, Adams, and Jefferson, but names like Florence Nightingale, Clara Barton, who founded the Red Cross, Roger Baldwin, who founded the American Civil Liberties Union, abolitionist and author Louisa May Alcott, Susan B. Anthony, Linus Pauling was one of four Unitarian Nobel Peace Prize winners, Buckminster Fuller, Frank Lloyd Wright, Pete Seeger, E.E. E. Cummings, Adlai Stevenson, Kurt Vonnegut, Paul Newman, who's known for being an actor but is survived by a company he founded that donates all its profits to charity. And I could spend a lot of time reading more and more names. I think you get the point. But I read that and I thought, what's happening here? You know, is this simply a case where you flip a, sometimes you can flip a coin 100 times and 99 times it comes up head, heads? <clears throat> I don't think so. I think the law of probability and my personal experience tells me something else is going on here. Part of the answer to that question, I believe, is that there's such a strong philosophy promoting individuals to make their own choices and to blaze their own trails regardless of what others do and regardless of the consequences. Emerson tells us over and over again to choose our own path and not to worry if there are no footsteps that have gone there before. Last year, I was on the AIDS walk that Jan Meslin helps promote, which is next Saturday. Um, and last year, it was a really hot day. We were, they were passing out bottled water to keep everyone hydrated. I found myself walking next to another member who seemingly out of the blue said, I feel guilty. I didn't know where that was coming from. And I asked, she said, I'm drinking water from a single use container. <laughs> now, it had been a rough time in the world that week. There had been brutal murders abroad and in the United States. There were stories of financial crimes, wage theft from employees, injustices at home. And from what I can tell, <clears throat> from what I could tell, none of the people involved in these crimes had the slightest feeling of remorse or guilt. And here I was in Orange County, California, walking next to a congregant who was feeling guilty about drinking water from a bottle that she was about to throw in a recycling bin. And it made me realize that this was the place where I needed to hang out. Several months ago, I read an account from a UU minister who was at an interfaith meeting on social activism, and there were lots of good-natured jokes because everyone said, you can't tell what UUs believe. And when it was his turn to speak, he was also good-natured. He was talking about the plans, but he finished by saying, I'll tell you who the UUs are. We're the ones who show up. <laughs> I thought he said it well. So I want to finish with another expression of gratitude and one of hope as well. I want to thank this congregation for making this a place where each person is expected to choose their identity, to exercise their freedom, and live a meaningful life. Sometimes you need a guide in life just as Dante needed Virgil, just as often we extinguish the chalice, and we have that great quote from Albert Schweitzer about providing a light when our own has gone out. So I thank you for making this a place where we're constant re constantly reminded that we're supposed to do something with our freedom, even if we don't have all the answers. And my hope is that someday I may be a source of encouragement for some of you. Don't be a neutral, embrace the freedom you have, Make a choice. Your choice will make a difference for all time. Oh, we could just stop there. Thanks a lot. <laughs> when I was talked, asked to talk on this subject, I, I realized that I had to, to really go back way far back in time to kind of figure out exactly 
how Unitarian Universalism and, and the religious freedom that it brings um, brought that about to be in myself. It started really far back. My great-grandfather, grandfather, and both uncles were all Methodist preachers. <laughs> my mom, daughter of a minister, um, all of my cousins, however, my older cousins, skipped it entirely. I have pilots and business people. So suddenly when I was young, they turned around to me and I said, okay, I had these rumblings of, would this mantle fall literally on my shoulders? <laughs> now the problem was early on in childhood, I didn't have parents that kept going to church. You know, my mom stopped, we, we'd go on the obligatory Sundays and, and holidays occasionally. My brother at the time had already been confirmed as an atheist, so he was way out of the running. So nothing there at all. I suppose I was at best an agnostic. Um, I had no desire to really be part of an organized religion. My pastor really didn't give me that, that belief. So I was kind of compelled to explore, did I have the freedom to not have a religion? So fast forward a little bit in high school. Through my last two years of high school, I was part of a chorus that actually sang at, at churches in the community. And uh, you know, I was the, the weird one that would get there early to want to sit through the entire service to say, does this fit for me? Is there anything that I can get out of this? None did. So maybe I was destined not to have an organized religion, and at the time it was okay with me. I was fine with that. I did envy friends that were entrenched in their religions. Um, I actually had one friend that when we would go away on, on spring break something, he would go to the Catholic Express Mass. They really have these. It's like a 10-minute Mass. You go in, you do the service, you get out. <laughs> Who, how did I know that? Now, during my first year of college, my father was forced out of a job of 20 years. He was given a job as an operations director for the Archdiocese Catholic Cathedral of Maryland. It's the Archdiocese, the biggest cathedral in, in the state. Now, this is, I really first started to begin to understand that not only did organized religions not appeal to me, what I saw was a lack of social understanding, inclusion, or compassion, and from the individuals that I associated with, with his work, a complete lack of religious freedom and a wholly prescriptive organization. So that just confirmed for me that I did not have a organized religion. Where do I go from there? As many things in life, good or bad, start. It all started from a website. <laughs> Beliefnet.com. <laughs> yeah, that's what I figured I would get a little bit of that reaction. Someone, Angela tells me later on it was her, um, told me that I should take this quiz. 100% Unitarian Universalist. All right, I have a religion. <laughs> Angela took the same test, of course, and even better, she was too. So we both had a religion now. What's a Unitarian Universalist? I had no idea. All I knew about UUism is that a friend of mine from high school and college, Rodney, was mercilessly teased for being a Unitarian. So, of course, now I really had to understand what a UU was. We went to the first Unitarian, first Unitarian Church of Baltimore. There were Catholics, there were Wiccans, there were atheists. We had a sitting co-minister that was a married couple. This is cool. I, I, can get in, I, can, I can understand this. They were not telling me what to believe. We all have the freedom to follow our own paths. Just some basic tenets, which seem more like common sense statements to me. I was really okay with that. So I was getting a little excited here. And, and as I was doing some research of this, I, I started thinking about what did Unitarian Universalism mean to me? How does it, how does it as, a, as a, a spiritual guide, what does it mean? And I came across an article, um, Freedom Isn't Free Even in Religion. It's by Thomas. It was defined what um, I had found universal Unitarianism to be. And the quote is, the choice to be an active part of the Unitarian Universalist movement comes with the understanding that you will have a say in governance, you will have the freedom to believe what your heart calls you to believe, and that you will be required to invest your time, your energy, your talents, and what money you can spare to the mission of a congregation and to the greater movement. I knew what I was. It didn't take long to feel at home. We joined the congregation shortly thereafter. We enjoyed the time we had in Baltimore. We met many good people. 
and really enjoyed attending an organized service. Who would have thought? <laughs> when Angela graduated from college and had her PhD, we moved to England. She was doing her postdoc. We moved to Cambridge. We had researched beforehand where we could possibly go. We already had this background. We wanted to maintain the momentum. When you know there was a Unitarian church within walking distance of our home. Fantastic. So we went one of the first weekends. We actually were met at the door by the minister who was wearing a black turtleneck and a pair of black leather pants. <laughs> Perfect. We know we're here. We introduced ourselves as first time our American accents came out of our mouths. He said, you are welcome. You will find us to be just a bit different. Hang in there. We first started the service, and the first thing they started saying was the Lord's Prayer. I said, wait a minute, where are we? <laughs> um, we went through the service. We tried to understand there is a huge difference between Unitarian and Unitarian Universalist, particularly when you're in the Church of England. So unfortunately, we did not find the spiritual home we were looking for there. Angela did find several Buddhist groups. She eventually actually found a Sangha there, which started her down her path. I, however, as reference to uh, a recent um, sermon from Reverend Kent, found it way too difficult to quiet my mind with meditation, no matter how much I really, really needed it and likely still do. <laughs> now, after living in England several years, we subsequently were kicked out of the country. That's another story. Ask me if you want to know. <laughs> we moved back to Arizona, um, a bastion of liberali liberality it was not. <laughs> Uh, we did find that it gave us a lot more to stand up for. We found Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Phoenix, where as an aside, we first met Jean Rosenberg, wave Jean. Just a sample of the wonderful congregation we found there. With the oppression and the conservative um, atmosphere all around us, finding the freedom against, uh, again, to be with like-minded people was frankly intoxicating. It was coming from a very oppressive area. Um, Angela joined the Occupy movement. I'm sure you're surprised about that. We both became members of the activist arm of UU, standing on the side of love. Fairly new even then. We attended many rallies and were introduced to the power of the yellow shirts. They were everywhere. We joined and threw ourselves into the congregation with abandon. Angela chaired the membership committee. I joined the preservation committee. We both found wonderful friends in the congregation once again. But as Buddha says, this too shall pass. We moved to California. Now, what can I say about Tappers that, that you don't already know? Um, we threw ourselves in here as well. We really felt as welcome to the first day we walked in here as we did the first day we walked into the congregation in Baltimore and understood what we were. Now, as many congregants here have, we have traveled a lot. We still do. Whenever we find ourselves in a new place on a new Sunday, we actually try to find a UU church to go to. Um, I, I wanted to end this part of the talk a little bit about one thing that was very, very recent. Uh, and the last trip we took, we actually were in a uh, first Unitarian church of New Orleans. Um, a very old church um, has recovered from the disasters extremely well. Now, during the service, the minister was discussing an upcoming meeting to solicit the ideas on how to implement changes to their worship time as a result of an event that had happened the previous year. And Angela and I were both very intrigued about this, and we did a little bit more research coming home. The reverend of that, of that congregation had issued a document, a letter, an open letter to the religious leaders of the community. I'm going to read the actual letter. It's recounted from Reverend Jim Vanderweel in New Orleans. On Sunday morning, July 20th, 2014, the sacred time and space of a historic New Orleans congregation was violated. As congregants of the First United Universalist Church held a moment of silent prayer to grieve a young woman of the church who had died the previous week, protesters from Operation Save America began to harangue the minister and spew words of hate to and at the congregation. In shock, but with increasing pain as these diatribes continued, the congregation listened quietly Protesters vilified and insulted them, and soon enough, the protesters were quietly ushered from the church. As this was happening in the sanctuary, other protesters holding grotesque images massed around the windows of the church nursery. 
screaming at the babies and toddlers. Youth were told that they were going to hell and that their family members were suffering from illness due to their sins. The church members responded by singing words of love, justice, and freedom to counteract the hateful rhetoric. Religious communities in the United States, the freedom to worship is a deeply cherished right. Whatever our faith, whenever we worship, the right to worship as we choose was fought for by our ancestors and is vital to all today. Along with this freedom comes the right to disagree, which is one part of the pluralism created by our religious freedom. But to all of us, we agree there is no one has the right to desecrate the sacred worship time and space in order to express their disagreement. People of faith do not agree on everything. In fact, some of us only agree that we should have the right to disagree. But that is enough. No congregation, whatever their views may be, should have their sacred worship time and space violated, not ever not by anyone. Reverend Vanderweel then called on 39 local religious leaders to stand with us with hearts joined on the side of love and in opposition to religious terrorism. That letter was signed by 40 other leaders of the faith community, including all religions, in solidarity and support of true religious freedom. This, my friends, is why I am a Unitarian Universalist and hold dear to my choice to be one. Thank you.